I said a brief bit of context. Obviously, as you probably know, this is uh, um, actually a continuation of a conversation. As Jenny has indicated, we started a conversation um, around the time of lockdown, which is really asking the question, um, what is the new normal uh, going to look like? Or is there, is there going to be a new normal? Um, how do we cope with all the massive issues that are rising? We particularly seized on a phrase from uh, the current Pope that uh, this is not so much an era of change as a change of era. And we began to ask the question, well, what, what does this um, new era actually look like? Because um, it's not that anybody's got any um, astounding answers, but together um, we do need to begin to discern what God might be saying to the churches um, in the midst of all of this. What contribution might we make? And so that conversation has led to a conversation that's focused on the language of contract and covenant, which we'll explore uh, in a little bit more detail before we go into uh, dialogue conversation. So that's um, what we're hoping to do, to explore what that means and to see how, practically speaking, churches can work in the local to begin to create a new kind of era, a new kind of reality. Jenny, you're going to... Um, yeah. Thanks, Martin. So we just thought that um, before we move on, it would be nice um, just to have a short prayer together to bless our time together. So I'm, I'm going to put a prayer in the chat and um, invite you to say it with us at home. And uh, Martin and I are just going to say alternate lines. And we'll start with just a short moment of silence. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, we welcome you here in our midst. Govern our hearts and minds, govern every aspect of our time together. Be in every thought and word, in every intention and motive. Lord, we thank you for those who've been an inspiration to us. Thank you for calling us through the gospel to work together and for each other. We pray for others working for the common good and for those who resist it. Bind us together across our traditions and move our heart's desire closer to the heart of your desire for us. Lord, give us the grace to do your will and make our mission a joy. In the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, Alan and Martin, Alan and Morris, you're going to take it from here. Thanks, Jenny. Um, Morris and I want to uh, share a little bit of conversation with each other coming out of um, the covenant document that we've written, but um, just to say that we are the chosen representatives of the whole team. So we're speaking on behalf of uh, the whole team. And to pick up a little bit, and then I'll invite Morrison to pick up a little bit on uh, what Jenny and Martin have described, is that um, we, we talk about um, the writing of a new chapter. And we talk about the kind of fear and anxieties that have really grip, gripped us, particularly here in North America around this pandemic, the crises of race. Um, but also what we're talking about is that behind these, if we pull the curtain back, behind these particular events, there's a larger issue at stake, particularly for the church. An issue that we would describe as failed stories. And what we want to do a little bit right now is talk together about what are these failed stories that have really come to colonize and shape our imaginations? And um, how do we begin to look at, again, what might be the primary stories that shape us as Christians? Morris, you want to pick up a little bit on the failed stories that are shaping us? 
Yeah, I, I, I would very much like to, and, and it's really good to be uh, with everybody. And, and first of all, I guess, I just want to acknowledge that this has been a very difficult time for me and for many people that I know, that there's a genuine grief around. And when I say grief, I mean a sense of loss, but also a sense of confusion and an anxiety about what happens next, a loss of direction um, as, as well. And, you know, before COVID happened, we were in tempestuous times. And what was breaking down really was the overwhelming progressive story about globalization, that it was an inevitable fate, that it, that it was good. And what you saw very clearly was, was three very surprising things popping up. Uh, the first is, unexpectedly, there was a sort of return to the nation state that was happening. And we saw that very strongly when COVID kicked in, when every nation state reverted to, to type um, with the reimposition of borders. Um, there was also a story about the, the re-emergence, at least, of these desacralized places, the abandoned places, the faraway towns, that there was a return to a sense of place. Um, hazy, chaotic, but nonetheless uh, a quite powerful one. Um, and, and the third was that suddenly, and we got that also in the early COVID period, that work mattered, that suddenly the dignity of labour, uh, you know, medical staff, delivery drivers, truck drivers, um, were suddenly um, held in greater esteem. But this has also, though, been, been combined during this period with the sort of intensification of... Uh, of this sort of thing, uh, an internet, the emergence of the internet, and the breaking down of, of civic relationships, of public relationships. That's also a massive part of, of, of the loss. So really our conversations have, have been about is how do we excavate the tradition? How do we find a meaningful way uh, to preserve a human life understood as a relational life with others in a particular place? How, how, how do those ideas of place of work, of love, how do we actually um, live those and make them real? I think in the midst of those questions, um, what, we, what we were beginning to see was that um, it, there, was a, there was a kind of a grief that began to settle in to the bones of people uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, whether we were shaped by church or not shaped by church. And this grief, our observations would be, this grief had to do with not only the loss of life that was happening, the loss of job, the fear of uh, will I have the, the economics to survive, but it was something else. It was that the only stories that seemed to be sustaining us were the stories of either science, they're gonna find something that will fix what's going on, or the stories of government, that there will be economics and bailouts. And it's not that those stories are wrong, they're necessary, but they are profoundly inadequate in terms of where we find ourselves. And what that did was begin to reveal the thinness of social life that we've created together and taken for granted. And it was around that, that we began to see again, what probably is obvious, that we have become a whole society shaped by a dominant narrative of individualism and of contract. And that in the midst of that, a whole other story has been lost. So that's some of the background of where we are. Morris, you may want to pick up on some of that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's precisely the analysis. And the important thing about the contract is that it's an exchange of uh, equivalence between hands. It happens once and it, it's over. It doesn't involve seeing um, anybody again. It, it's not reciprocal in that way. It doesn't bind people across time. It doesn't take into account uh, power. It doesn't take take into account context and, and it's instrumental. So we found certainly that excavating the meaning of, of covenant 
definitely created a framework through, through which we could conceptualize how to preserve the sanctity and integrity of human beings, of nature and of community when they are so threatened. Because what Al said is right, it, is that there's science and, and, and there's uh, government and the state, but there's also the market, you know, that's another one. And, and all of these pressures to turn us into commodities our environment into commodities to pursue individual careers um, undermines our capacity to relate over time and and that that's the crucial insight I think that we came to together and and our point is not that we go around with that intention in our mind it's that this has become the way of life that has, has just sunk into our bones in our life uh, uh, in my experience for example um, when uh, we talk with people in churches and congregations about engaging with their neighbors. Um, it, it's astounding that people recognize that is a proper action to do, but their question in the midst of it is, and what are gonna be the outcomes of that? And, and so you see how deep this transactional way of life has become and is shaping us. And when as with the COVID, as with the crisis of race, when, when the systems begin to crack and break down, that kind of transactionality and contract are very, very thin in terms of how we live. Yep. Let me pass it back now to uh, Martin and Jenny. So, thanks very much, Alan and Morris. What, what we're going to do now is um, we're going to listen to a story um, from William. Um, so. Father William Taylor is, uh, has been part of our conversations the last few weeks and, and he's a parish priest in East London. So we're just thinking now about this sense of grief that Al and Morris have been talking about. And I think we want to bring it down to earth and say, how are we responding right now where we are? Because all of us on this call, we're all in different locations, neighborhoods, we are from different traditions. So what does it look like where you are? So while William and I are talking, um, please do share your thoughts in the chat. Um, so William, you are a parish priest in East London. Um, can you tell everyone a bit about yourself to start with and also then to share a bit about what happened in your parish around this sense of grief? Okay, so I'm, I'm William. It's good to be with you. Good to be with you all. Um, I'm uh, Church of England vicar in Hackney. Hackney is a, a bit of inner London that's just north of the city of London. So it has, it has, it's a home for, for mobile capital. Lots of the, the housing stock has been brought up and, and regenerated. And it's a home for mobile people, pe poor people on the move, um, who live in many of the, the housing estates. And um, my own parish is in northeast Hackney, it's in Stamford Hill. The people who come to my church are mainly West African, uh, Ghanaian, Nigerian and, and Caribbean. Uh, there are a few white people too. And uh, they work in retail, they have a few professional people, quite a lot of them work in the offices um, where, where people used to work in the city of London when they, when they went in there, um, cleaning them. So uh, that's, that's kind of my context. And uh, they live on the, my parishioners live on the housing estates. There are, there are five housing estates uh, around a common directly outside the church. And uh, the housing estates are where, uh, it's public housing. So it's where, uh, where they live in, in quite cramped conditions, some of them. Um, and so also around this common, there are, there are probably a half a dozen synagogues because uh, Stamford Hill, some of you may know this, is the, is the heart of ultra-Orthodox Haredi Judaism in Europe. So kind of like a, a Brooklyn in, in, in London. And, uh, and that's a very, it's a very organized community and in many ways an inspiration to the rest of us in, in the way that it is organized itself. And in the middle of this common, there is a, or there was a redundant toilet block. 
uh, that had been vacant for for the last thirty years. It had been it had been empty and and, and squatted and and had been you know, been left by the council that owns it uh, to fall into disrepair. And about seven years ago, a group of us neighbours formed a group called Clapton Commons, and we and we subsequently became a charity. And we decided to, um, amongst other things, to see if we can. Uh, bring it back to life. So we, we put together a plan and we raised a bunch of money uh, through a crowdfunding um, project. And uh, last year we, we got agreement with the council and we started this project, this regeneration project. And the, and the hoardings went up around um, Liberty Hall, as we call it. it. For those of you know who know Liberties of London, it looks a bit like, <laughs> looks a bit like Liberties of London. It's a sort of Elizabethan half timbered thing going on. So uh, it was all going terrifically well, and we'd booked a big launch with the Bishop of London, with the Bishop of Stepney, Joanne, and um, the Mayor of Hackney, and my friend Rabbi Pinter, who's one of the leading ultra Orthodox rabbis who's done a lot to bring this community together um, for the end of April. And then in, in, in February and March, the virus arrived and everything went on hold. And uh, the, the work on the, on the actual building stopped. The church closed, third Sunday in Lent, I think it was our last Sunday. And we became a sort of a service delivery organization. We were, we were you know, we had a food bank already and uh, it increased in numbers and a lot of my time over those months was spent sort of upping our game, getting, getting a bit more organized around that. But I spent a lot of time, you know, sorting out boxes in the attic and eating a lot of toast. I got, you know, put a bit of weight on. And I started going out for these early morning runs around the common. And on the hoardings of the of Liberty Hall, we 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 painted previously "thank you" the words "thank you" and thanking all the the donors who had contributed towards the project. Um, in in fact, the local Orthodox Jewish lads, it was nice to see they had they had graffitied "thank you Hashem" on the on the hoarding as well, the word for God, just to remind us, you know, to God be the glory. Um, but it didn't. It wasn't the right messaging. In the in the in the pandemic, thank you. And uh, I just felt uncomfortable about it. And then in the middle of April, my friend uh, Abraham Pinter, the local rabbi, died. He died of COVID. He got he got the disease when he was going around the synagogues telling them to disperse. And it was terrible. I just felt, you know, just like when someone you you, you love dies suddenly in shock. And, uh, and I wanted, and other people I knew, friends of friends, a good friend of my brother's died. And we decided um, that we would start, well, I talked to my neighbors, the people who put the hoardings up, the people who did the fundraising, whether we could uh, start pasting the names of those who died on the, on the hoarding. So we painted out the words, we agree. Uh, and we put up, as you can see in this, in this picture, um, the words, we grieve. And every Thursday evening, uh, on that, on the on the occasion when in the United Kingdom we came together to to applaud the National Health Service, the clap for the NHS, we met and we we pasted the names of those who who died recently that week, um, and they were people known to us. They were people who lived within walking distance of of the of the parish, and it was it was a small it was a small gathering, socially distanced gathering. You can see I got my, my social distancing stick with me, two meters long, and poke anyone that came any nearer to me than that. And it got, you know, it got quite a lot of interest. Um, we, it wasn't a faith act as such. It was, we called it uh, a, a marking of civic grief. So, uh, it, you know, although I, I put, on, put on my cassock and, and, I, and I went out with my, with my big stick, um, it wasn't in any way a Christian event, although, you know, it wasn't entirely clear what it was. I think there was a sense that it was a sacred space where we were honouring our dead. And, uh, and you know, remembering the, the, the people we'd loved and lost. 
Oh, he got some think, attention. You had you had a lot of um, people coming up to you and thanking you for this, and um, a number of gatherings took place. Was it every Thursday night? Is that right? Yeah, that's that's. So we met weekly to to commemorate those those that had died, and. Um, the mayor of Hackney came down, he himself pasted the name of Rabbi Pinter on the wall and the Associated Press, the press agency came and did a story about it and, and so it went out on the wires across the world and turns out we're quite big in Kansas and there was a story uh, that reached North Carolina and there was a, there was a and this, this is Marcia Mullins who was a resident of one of the housing estates locally who's lost her brother and um, an in, uh, a, a uh, a prisoner in a, in a um, correction centre in North Carolina wrote to me because he'd seen it in the papers and, and he wanted to uh, let Marcia know that he also knew what it meant to lose a brother. And so it, 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 felt, it felt like although it was an extremely local event, it was touching a chord in people's lives. Anyway, then uh, July came and we had the great easing. When, uh, when we began to be able to congregate more easily and the, the workers came back to the, to the building and they finished off and the hoardings came down. And, and we began to, to wonder whether to continue this, this regular weekly meeting or not. Um, and as we talked, there, there, was a, there was a real sense that you know, the, the grief was deep and it wasn't just about the people who we'd lost. Uh, it was about the way of life that we were losing and, uh, and, and the, you know, the dislocation that we felt. Um, so those conversations are ongoing and we're, to some extent, we're trying to work out what to do. But I think, as I reflect on that, you know, grieving, lamenting is something that we do in the church. And this, this event gave me an opportunity to share a practice that is, it is actually quite familiar to, to, to me as a parish priest and to, and to Christians with people who didn't have that experience. And to, in a way, own the common, Clapton Common, as, as common land and a sacred space, to sort of re-sacralise uh, that space. And it, it felt, and it has felt, that people have responded to that and have, and have wanted that and have sort of joined in that in that journey and of course you have to remember this was a time that uh, there was great rage over the over the um the black lives matter protests and all over the all over the world statues were being pulled down and thrown into the waters um but here we were putting up the names you know honoring the names of the of the of the loved ones many of whom actually were from the windrush generation on our on our hoarding it felt like it felt like the right answer to the current question that we were facing and can i can i just ask you um to say a little bit about what you were talking about the other day we were talking about you wearing your cassock and the kind of message that 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 gives because you could have done this in your civvies as it were and sometimes some church leaders feel a sense of awkwardness about being church in a public space and what was that like for you? And why do you think that worked? Well, you have to remember that everyone dresses up in Stanford Hill. The the, the <laughs> Arabi Jews, yeah. who are everywhere, um, you know, wear wear a, a uniform. Um, as I think there was a photograph just a moment ago of one of the one of our um, Muslim friends who who's clearly dressed up. So it, it didn't it didn't feel that it didn't feel that um, surprising, but. Um, what was interesting was that the local the local newspaper um, Hackney Citizen put a put a, one of these photographs on the front page of the month of July of their monthly publication, um, and underneath the caption they said you know there was a, a weekly um, non faith uh, event that took place in Clapton Common. Um, you know I I wouldn't have really said it was a non faith event. I'd say that it was it had faith at its at its heart. Um, although I think, you know, the secular world would prefer not to see that. But um, it just wasn't, it wasn't, didn't belong to any particular, any particular faith. And I, and I just think that's one of the things that, that I needed to sort of work out in my own mind. This was, I was, I was claiming a space 
um, but I wasn't doing so in any way as a Christian, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a member of my Christian community. I was doing so in a, in a way that was um, both modern and ancient. You know, the practice of lament, which is what this is, yeah. I think has within it um, a promise of covenant. You know, we, 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 we grieve because we have the memory of how things once were and that the bonds that once united us have been broken. And it's only if we have that memory somewhere in the back of our mind, we can recall it, yeah. that we're able to recognize what we've lost. Uh, so I think that that's, as I reflect upon it now, that's, that's, that's the kind of movement that I think we were um, witnessing to. Okay, thank, thank you so much. I think that's really helpful. And there've been some fantastic thoughtful comments in the chat. Um, I just wondered whether, um, Morris, you might like to say something about the anxiety that leaves people exhausted that um, Justin raised. Um, yeah, so with, without public relationship, without any means, um, also what Ryan was talking about, um, um, I've also been taking refuge in the, in the Psalms and, you know, engaging with previous areas of grief and loss. Um, and, and Jill's making the same point, is, is, is that without some public manifestation um, of love at, at a time of grief, what you have is this never-ending, exhausting anxiety that, that can find no resolution. And it's a personal anxiety, it's a disintegration of community anxiety, and it's a very, very structural anxiety, as we simply don't know, you know, we know what's coming, the evictions are coming, the unemployment is, you know, this is, so it's multiple levels of, of, of grief and anxiety that can find no redemption. And so I'm very, very interested in that idea of redemption um, and to change the dynamics of this. Um, Al, did you want to add anything to what you've seen in the, in the comments? I think that, uh, <clears throat> I pick up, uh, I think, Anne Morrissey's comment that uh, there's this uh, continuum that we drift back and forth between uh, sort of both resignation. Uh, it's there, it's upon us, what can we do about it? And indignation, uh, which over here, like there, gets shown in ways like the government's not going to tell me to wear a mask, I'm going to do, there's all of these things going on. And I think she's absolutely right that inside a culture of individualism and transactional relationships, we don't have a way of getting at it. We don't have a healthy way of dealing with this, which is why, I, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, we need another narrative here. We need another set of practices which the churches themselves uh, can engage in and have memory of. Uh, so I think, I think Anne's comments are, are very accurate. So um, we're gonna hand over to Sarah Jane now, um, who's gonna lead us in a, in a short liturgy, uh, sort of change gear for a few moments. Yeah, the, thank you, Jenny. The, the changing gear is really an honoring of the conversation around grief, the, the mm -hmm. naming of the space that we find ourselves in, and also an honoring of the fact that we, we share a certain um, sense of commitment here as followers of Jesus, and we want to name that in the midst of this conversation as we move into talking more about covenant and what this um, covenantal call to be in relationship is about together. So I want to invite, um, invite you all actually to uh, participate with us in this. And how this is gonna work is that four of us, um, myself, uh, Jenny, um, William, and Fred, are going to take turns reading through um, the liturgy that you see in front of you. And I would encourage you uh, either to listen, just to um, listen and let these words um, wash over you and enter you. Or I would encourage you also to just join us on um, in reading the whole thing or in bold, just on the bold part as well. Um, there are a couple um, <clears throat> that we will speak together. So let's speak these words together 
as we continue to reflect on covenant and this renewing of a covenant that, um, that we're exploring together today. We believe and trust in God the Father Almighty. We believe and trust in Jesus Christ, his Son. We believe and trust in the Holy Spirit. We believe and trust in the three in one. Lord, we know that you are good. Your steadfast love endures, your faithfulness to all generations. You continue to show us your goodness in the midst of confusion. We see the signs of your promise in anxiety and doubt. Lord, we know that you are good. Lord, Lord awaken us to your presence. You call us to another way of being in the world, to be in covenant with our neighbours, being with and alongside. Lord, awaken us to your presence. In the places we live, work, rest and wait, may we be attentive and open to your life among us. Lord, awaken us to your presence. In our work, frustration, struggle and grief, May we trust your faithfulness and presence among us. Lord, awaken us to your presence. In, our, in the shared concerns of neighbours around us, may we tune our hearts and minds and lives to your voice at work. Lord, awaken us to your presence. Lord, you call us to another way of being in the world, to be in covenant with our neighbours, being with and alongside. Lord, awaken us to your presence. We believe and trust in God, the Father Almighty. Creator God, you are faithful and continue to shape us, form us, and call forth life from among us. We believe and trust this day. Mm. We believe and trust in Jesus Christ, his son. Lord Jesus Christ, you came and dwelt among us, inviting us to join you in the making of all things new. We believe and trust this day. We believe and trust in the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, you fill the whole earth and each place and each parish, creating new life and renewing our whole earth with hope. We believe and trust this day. We believe and trust in the three in one. Triune God, your kingdom comes, often disorientating, but filled with wonder, justice, grace and mercy. We believe and trust this day. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So we wanted to invite um, a story. If you'll notice, we've got a story from one side of the Atlantic, and now we're going to invite Fred to share a story from um, this side of the Atlantic, where some of us are here. Um, and Fred, I wonder if, so, so Fred's been invited to share a story about um, what it looks like to be um, stepping into covenantal commitments and relationships in the local place where, where he is. And Fred, you can just introduce yourself, I think, a little bit and say what you would like <laughs> and then share with us um, a little bit of your story because we're, we're really um, looking forward to hearing from you today. Yeah, well, I am honored to be here with you all. Uh, so I am one of the pastors here in Williamsburg Christian Church. We are a 54-year-old congregation uh, arising from the Restoration Tradition. Uh, we are in Williamsburg, Virginia, which forms the historic triangle of Jamestown, Yorktown, and Williamsburg. So there's a rich history of America's birth in our, in our city, in our town, uh, Colonial Williamsburg, a living museum. Uh, so the story of the United States of America, the story of revolution, is told and retold and told and retold in embodied ways beyond museums of pictures, but with live bodies living out the drama of the revolution and the day-to-day -day life. It's a fascinating place. Uh, it's a fascinating place because of the parts of the story we often choose to tell uh, and the parts of the story we often choose to omit. 
Uh, so as a congregation, we are uh, diverse socioeconomically. We have a long uh, history of relationship with our neighbors living through social displacement, meaning neighbors living through homelessness within our city. Consequently, we have uh, relationships with uh, people who serve those who uh, walk uh, with our neighbors living through social displacement. We are multi-ethnic for our locality, meaning we have uh, brothers and sisters of color, uh, as well as um, men and women and neighbors living through intellectual disability, uh, serious mental illness and such. We even have some Nigerian nuns from the Sister of St. Francis who are a part of our congregation. Uh, as they care for our neighbors living through um, intellectual disability uh, and serious mental illness and developmental disability. So we, we are uh, quite a ragamuffin group of people. Uh, we are about everything in our church and it's what makes us beautiful and it's what makes things challenging and it's also what awakens us to the realities of all sorts of suffering that arise in the lives of people. So for us, hospitality is a core organizing understanding of gospel where we want to have solidarity. We want to seek solidarity with, with, with strangers in our midst, the mutual relationship of faithful presence, of compassion and generosity to share in the struggle of the dignity and worth and empowerment so that together we can experience human flourishing. And a part of that uh, has called us during this time to make sure that as a congregation, we aren't just turning our eyes inward. We practice lament, and, and brother, I appreciate what the Father said. We, we practice lament, we grieve, so that has to be a part of who we are. We have to name the ills, especially racial injustices, where we have to name the things in concrete realities that are impacting people and creating suffering. But a part of that experience and having lament and naming things, as we call it, uh, in our congregation, part of that is to move us to make sure that while we're suffering and grieving, we don't miss the grief of our neighbors. We don't miss the suffering that's all around us. The suffering of those who are living, in, who, who were socially displaced before we all felt socially displaced due to COVID, right? People who, who didn't feel as though they had a sense of home and a sense of belonging and a sense of understanding, a means by which they could understand themselves and orient themselves toward the life-giving story. So we have to be a people who have relationships with those neighbors, which also means we need to have a relationship with the people who serve those neighbors. So for 10 years, we have had relationships with um, what's called our human services, uh, which is a part of our governmental uh, arm, uh, an organization, a part of the branch of government that serves people living through poverty and other things. And as we served and, and are a part of the life of neighbors who live through poverty and live through social displacement, we became a, a, we created an extended family with the men and women who serve in human services. And so there's been several things that we've, we've been able to do. Um, one of the things that we have committed to as a church family is to make sure that we have a reliable presence. And, and I can't stress that enough from my end. We have to be reliable. Rarely when we get a call from the city um, or a call from human services, do we say no. When we're asked to serve as the people of God, we say yes. We figure out how later, <laughs> but we say yes on the front end because we want to be reliable. There was a couple of ways that we were asked to be present. Um, when our winter shelter here in our locality due to COVID had to disband, uh, our church building was left empty we wanted to make sure that our building was left available for all of our neighbors living through homelessness to come and sleep and to be safe during the pandemic. This was in the onset of the pandemic. And we partnered with our city's human services department to make sure that uh, the stories were told and that services were coordinated, that care could be found. And we wanted to be a part of that. Uh, and so we are here to serve at the pleasure of the human flourishing of our city, which includes our human services department. One of the things that we have been able to do uh, is we have been able to make sure that we know the names of all of the social services and human services workers in our locality. And we wanted to make sure that as they are frontline first responder um, workers in our locality, we wanted to make sure that they knew that they weren't lost on us, that we see them. We see them in their struggle. We see them in the fight. We see them in their sorrow. And so we wanted to do something as simple and as ordinary um, as send cards, uh, make videos and send the videos to the department heads and let those videos disseminate through 
the department to let them know that there is a people in this city who exist to be there as a reflection of the love of the triune God, to be there for them to say, we see you, you are not lost on us. If you are okay with this, we will pray for you. If you're not, that's okay, but we see you and we are here for you. And that has borne beautiful fruit, beautiful conversations, beautiful connections, uh, where we hopefully, by the grace of God, can be a reliable presence who are not just focused on an event every week, as important as that may be, who are not just focused on ourselves, but who are focused on being faithfully present in our city, especially during a time of suffering and grief. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, so very much. Um, Al, I wanted to turn it over to um, you and to Morris and Martin to help um, reflect upon Fred's comments and move us into talking about more about this faithful presence in this covenantal way. So thanks, Fred, and thanks, Sarah Jane, for uh, introducing Fred. Um, those of you who read the uh, letter that uh, came with this invitation uh, will see very prominently the words contract and covenant. And I guess we've probably got a bit of an idea of what we mean by these terms, but we want to just tease out uh, a little bit more um, what we mean and why these terms are significant. So, um, Alan and Morris, either one of you can start in, but when you say the word contract, um, what, what do you really mean by that? Um, and are there some concrete examples you could give in terms of how a contract-based society impacts people and, and the difference that makes? Yeah, well, a, a, a contract is a one-off exchange between people um, of equivalent between hands on the whole that doesn't ever imply that, that you will meet again. It's, it's for mutual advantage. It ignores what Fred was talking about there, which is the power inequalities between people the, um, and where they come from. And, and so, um, and covenant in contrast is based on long-term faithful relationships. That's the very, very essence of it, that you don't just exit from the obligation. It's, it's rooted in place. And it's worth going through the, the things that we've discovered. It's intergenerational, so that there's a very strong stress on the future, um, drawing inspiration from the past. It binds generations in that way. There's a trust in the land. It's a really important aspect of, of nature. Of, um, and, and what we found as well in Covenant was that there's the element of the forgiving of debts, the redemption of debts. Um, and that's going to be very relevant right, right now when it comes to the, um, here in Britain, we've had the furlough to businesses. There's been a temporary moratorium on evictions, but they're coming now. They're, they're beginning to go away. So, and, and that debt forgiveness is tied up with the renewal of trust of mutual um, obligation. <clears throat> so um, we found the contract was a very good way of conceptualizing the last 40 years. You get the most that you can from an immediate circumstance. Uh, and, and, and what Fred was talking about just there was actually being a faithful neighbor, was staying in there and learning the names, preserving humanity, a human relationship, both with the people um, who, who, are, who are homeless or socially misplaced or going through mental health issues, but also keeping the public services human, because this is the danger, the inhumanity of both state and market procedures render people commodities or administrative units. And so one essential part of the covenantal tradition is to preserve human relationships. Anyway, that's just a, that's just a beginning of looking at the contrast between contract and covenant. One of the ways uh, it strikes home to me particularly, which is not new, is when I walk around my community or bike in other places, I see these signs on, uh, on poles. And the signs say, uh, this is a neighborhood watch community. Um, and what those signs do is communicate to me the, the, the primary and often only way in which people are relating to each other, which, which is inherently contract and transactional. 
because it's saying we don't know each other and we are going to look out for strangers and if there are strangers we are going to come together like white blood cells to deal with it and that's the contract in which people live together with each other so that's an example of the way in which contract not in a formal sense but is embedded in our habits and our ways of life now part of this for me martin is that what we are talking about in covenant is something which in a lot of ways is is both foolish and wasteful mm. but gets to the core of the grief that's going on because the grief that's going on i think is people's deep sense of the absence of alternatives what alternatives are there to the contractual ways that we're living we don't know any uh, the only way we can deal with this stuff is contract and transactionalism so when we talk about covenant which we'll talk about a little more deeply what we're talking about is how we begin and the we is the church god's people how do we begin to practice different kinds of habits which in the light of where we are look utterly inadequate and foolish but which are massively transformational yeah so what's at stake really as, as far as i see it and and thanks mark and also to stephen for your comments i'm, I'm really interested in them um, what's at stake is 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 the is relationships the possibility of finding out where we are and what to do in relationship with others and no no real avoiding uh, as far as i'm concerned the practice which sounds so straightforward of the one-to-one -one relational meeting of talking to others discovering where they are and engaging with them and that seems to me the absolute antithesis of the contractual instrumental culture that went before to actually build faithful relationships faithful public relationships with others through this idea of the one-to-one -one, uh, relational meeting and through that a far deeper sense of the threats that are coming and that the only way to resist those threats is to have those ties with others that Fred that are based not just on knowing their names but knowing who they are and, and where they are uh, and building a genuine sense of a community based on love and faithfulness rather than on money or power it's it's that straightforward with the with the covenantal promise and to recognize that it's a radically challenging and disruptive way of life to choose i, I think of the story of Ruth and Naomi, uh, wherever you go, I will go, your people will be my people, of how that gets lived out, not in some abstract way inside a church building, but it gets lived out on the ground in the community where we are. And when you start to do that, you begin to recognize how very, very difficult that is. Um, just a concrete example of uh, the, the way I seek to build conversation and relationship with several of my neighbors. Uh, and having been here seven years to realize that you don't build relationships unless you're around about that long. Um, but, but more than that, in our culture is to recognize that somehow, and I think it's the fault of the British, built into the Canadian imagination is that it's okay for us to talk to each other, but it's not okay as neighbors to cross any boundary beyond that. So it, it, it's, there's, there's a lot of work to be done here and to pick up on what Morris says in terms of covenant, it can only be work that's done if we are committed to the place where we are and we're not going to go anywhere and this one is a big deal for churches because most of our churches 
are formed around the evisceration of place and life inside a building that has no relationship to where people live. So this call to covenant is a massively disruptive narrative and yet at the same time is, is as simple as what Morris is saying. How do I love another person who lives beside me? So uh, how do I get to know them? I mean, yeah. this, is, this is the thing. And, and one of the causes of the, of the grief is, is that people are, are extremely lonely or confined to family. It's to engage with the people around you, hear, hear their stories, hear where they're out, and build a common life together. That's the covenantal promise, if you like. Yeah. Well, that theme of the common life is, is uh, a very ancient theme, and I think we're aware that we, we have a memory of covenant, um, and the issue becomes, uh, well, what does that actually look like now in the context in which we're, we're now operating? So, Alan, um, you were going to um, pose a question or two to those who are participating with us. Uh, why don't you launch into that right now? And we'll open up the chat <laughs> to yeah. all, all the participants. Yeah, well, let, uh, let me frame the question in a couple of ways. Uh, you've heard us begin to talk tentatively, and you've seen it in the document that we produce. Uh, but as you're listening from where you are um, in the community and neighborhood you are as a leader, uh, what does covenant mean to you or for you? And what do you think might be involved? for you as a leader amongst your people are beginning to shape this kind of covenant life where you are. We'd love to hear some of your responses to those two questions. What, did, what does it mean to you where you are? And what does it look like potentially to shape that kind of covenant life where you are? Can I suggest that um, just at the moment that it might be a good idea, um, Morris, if you were to respond to um, Peter Selby's point about um, the, what he calls the coup d'etat and then you responded to him in the chat that this has to be resisted. Could you expand a bit on that? I think that's something that um, people might be interested to hear. Yeah, I, I, essentially, Peter, um, what I'm saying is, is that there are very, um, to put it bluntly, wicked and evil powers at work in the world, and, um, and, they, and they work um, nationally, and they, and they work through uh, procedures, and they work stru structurally. So the essential question that we're confronting is, um, how, how do we resist and preserve a, a human community which is itself besieged? So what I'm saying is, is, is that in America, where I'm not, there is obviously a, a national political um, conflict taking place. But it's also vital to build local relationships so that, so that you can continue to live or even have a conception of the kingdom of God where you are. This is, this is the vital thing. Uh, because it's not ultimately in your power how that goes on, on November the 3rd, but it is part of your life, um, how you relate to the people around you. That's, that's the beginning of, of what I'm getting at in the conversation with Peter. On Facebook, uh, Kathy Walker says, how do we build a common life under, uh, together under these COVID circumstances? That's a really good question. And uh, somebody's come back, and uh, Joan actually, uh, Joan Branahan said, asking if neighbors need anything. Okay, that's an interesting direct response. Um, so, um, Aaron John Kennedy says, what was Peter Selby's question, please? What was Peter's question? Can uh, somebody read that out? Uh, Peter's uh, question was... Jenny, Jenny was you're it? muted if you were reading it out. Yeah, Sorry, Peter was saying um, before relationships can happen, we need to find a way of resisting the electorally validated coup d'etat under which many of us are living. That's the question. Mm. And, and, and that relates also, uh, Peter, to different conceptions of politics. Politics is not exhausted by national politics. Uh, a real sense of um, being embedded and participating in a local community is far closer to 
my meaning of politics and and that's related to all how do you create bonds that can resist what is happening the overwhelming power of money and the overwhelming power of the state to move us around and govern our lives and how do we act as both participants and witnesses to preserve love and humanity in human relationships that's that's what i think is going on with this covenantal conversation and somebody has picked up that theme uh, by talking about uh, a caritas perspective and uh, i'm actually i'm sorry i'm not exactly sure how to pronounce your first name that's forgive my ignorance but um, uh, she says, I would like to help Catholics in East Anglia to consider the idea of covenant with each other and with the poor and mar marginalized locally. And I think that that word locally is, is so <laughs> immensely important. Thank you for that. I think um, Mark Branson's question perhaps is playing with and teasing with that question of local and neighborhood where there's a recognition that structurally certainly in the second half of the 20th century in North America, we created what he would call ethnographic centric communities, people all the same. Um, and how do we deal with that in this conversation that we're having about covenant? Mm. Yeah. And there was a challenge actually from a church leader in England who's coming from a, a, a Caribbean perspective who was asking a similar question about uh, how do we help um, those who are living in very distinct ethnically, um, um, single ethnicity cultures to develop that wider covenant with the community uh, in which they're living. And, and that's actually, I mean, I think that's a really amazing question. Uh, and one of the things I'm seeing in the UK in our larger cities uh, would be third and maybe even fourth generation children from those uh, eth ethnic groups beginning to form um, meaningful, I would say, covenantal relationships uh, with friends um, from many, many ethnicities. And that, that can be also a threat because they're leaving <laughs> the, the immediate uh, community that kind of preserved a culture for a time uh, and created a new kind of culture, but it's actually quite an interesting development. Yeah, and it's completely counterintuitive. I'm, I'm, I'm really good to hear from you, uh, Sean, um, in, in Manchester. It's, it, it sounds so simple and counterintuitive, but the capacity to actually give your time and listen and also to speak, to be heard, it's not just a, a one-way street to, to create these relationships through one-to-one -one conversation is, is really the absolutely necessary starting point um, for, for this move, which Stephen is, is right when he writes for Brixton. You know, we've got, we've got to, it takes time. And, the, and, and what we're looking for is outcomes and outputs, but really, we, we've got to spend the time uh, to listen and to speak to others. Mm. And I love the comment uh, from uh, somebody, I've just lost the comment, uh, but it was, uh, ah yes, it's from Father Chris. Covenant is also a word full of hope, full of promise, full of potential. It is gospel. <laughs> I, I, lo I love that. Um, I love the hope. Yeah, but it's, it's not false hope. That's the point, it, is that it gets us out of our heads, gets us into relationship uh, with others. And through that, you, you build um, new forms of, of community. And, and that relates exactly, we are moving towards a, a notion of sharing space, of, of a common good between different peoples. This can only be negotiated between the people themselves. It's not gonna come from above. That's and another very important idea. And Karen, a, Karen Wilk is pointing to a very concrete uh, set of practices, which we'll, we'll perhaps come back to in a moment. Jenny, go ahead. I just wanted to draw attention to uh, Ryan's comment, really interesting comment um, about the difference between the one-to-one -one, um, conversation and having meetings and business meetings uh, among sort of church culture. 
um, just wondered if, if one of you would like to make a comment on that, because there is a tendency, isn't there, for churches to want to jump with the latest program and, uh, you know, roll out the latest project and so on. And I think what we're talking about with one to one conversations here is is not to programatize the thing. And, and it's really about building relationships with people. So would, would one of you want to respond to that? Yeah, that, 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 that's fundamental. So there is something that happens in a one-to-one -one conversation that can't happen in a team meeting. Uh, and that is the establishment of uh, simultaneously, on the one hand, shared vulnerability, uh, and on the other hand, a, a promise that you can do something together. And what that thing is, is shared between you. So this is all part of what I was talking about in the move from contract to, to covenant is the priority of, of neighborliness, of, of public friendship, of listening and speaking and nurturing love as, as a genuinely real and possible uh, definition of human relationship in recognition of all the forces that are there to disrupt it. I think that that's vital. So this, the one-to-one the -one is the way and it's not going to be solved by policy. It's not going to be solved by an initiative. It's got to be built by people together. Mm. A number of people um, have uh, typed in some really concrete examples. Uh, Jeff Knott has reminded me of a story I told. <laughs> uh, it wasn't just a story. It was a, a descriptor, an article about a church in Bolton. Uh, and um, there's a lovely story from um, a church in southern Sweden. Uh, these are great concrete examples of the way in which covenant can be worked out. Yeah, and um, and I agree. And there was a, a um, Hakan in 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 Sweden. So there is. It, it's it's just the recognition of the dignity of every human life that is around you, and that is a source of strength to you if you are in relationship and and it can't but what i'm saying certainly is this can't be done any other way and and uh and you're right the sign of the the real sign of the covenant the genuine covenant is that is the rainbow <laughs> you know that that's real it's not just a sign of support for nhs workers it's genuinely the sign of the first covenant to, to me one of the uh the larger questions in what we're doing uh, certainly from the perspective of um, North America is is how as leaders we invite congregations to see their vocation as located in their neighborhoods and communities and as to Morris's point creating these relationships um, in my mind the, the, the practical on the ground question becomes, how do we actually cultivate those kinds of gatherings of God's people? Um, the, the, um, that's the question that for me is critical. Well, it takes, it takes courage. Yeah. You know, Akan again from Sweden has just said it, you know, it's not just about, it's not, a, it's not just a how can we give and how can we help. It's not a one way, it's that it's mutually supportive. It's, it's genuinely reciprocal. Yeah. And that's, that's a, a, a vital part of this. And to meet another person is to make yourself vulnerable. That's the difference, Jenny, with the meeting. You, we could all sit in a meeting and make an odd comment and think we've got away with it. But to meet a, another person one-to-one -one and to talk about what's causing you grief and what you could do together to alleviate that it, it is a hard thing to do. And, and that's the essential message that I'm certainly um, trying to give today is that to have the courage to do that, talk about it to other people too, you know, but make that the central practice. And then you will discern what's going on where you live and to be able to build a, a structure a, around you which can be mutually supportive of, mm. of human, of of the grace of humanity. I think that's part yeah, I of think that, that, that comment from Hakan um, about 
meeting people eye to eye and not just me giving is really powerful but it's really important for, for it's a lot of um churches sometimes get stuck in becoming a sort of service provider rather than being a living alongsider and it's it's a sort of shift that we're we're talking about here is Absolutely. it's not just yeah. about service it's about relationship and so there might be things that you're already doing as as a church that you can shift by by looking at how do we engage with people is this just us serving others or is it us actually in relationship with other people in a reciprocal mm -hmm. equal mutual respect kind of way yeah it, it's is that you need help too you know the the relate it, the relational work is is mutually supportive it's not just about giving a lovely comment on Facebook from uh, Aaron John Kennedy about work they're doing in Battersea and he points particularly to uh, some training that they're doing uh, in his local parish church uh, around one-to-one -one conversations and uh, in a few minutes we're going to come on to that. Let's do it. Let's okay. do it. Do it. So, Jenny, do you want to lead into that for a minute? And then I've got a little something to say about that, too. OK. So um, what, we were, what we're suggesting here is um, about the one to one conversation. We're actually suggesting that, um, that you might in your congregation, in your church, actually adopt this as a practice um, in order to intentionally meet people in the neighborhood. And we know that um, many churches do something like this already but um, it requires a certain sense of uh, authenticity as a Christian practice and so we've put together a short two-pager uh, for you which um, Sarah Jane's going to put in the chat um, shortly so you can download it straight away um, and we can assure you that if you if you do a number of one-to-ones in this way that you will find out what's going on where you are and, and what is needed where you live. So this is really about a humble church building genuine companionship with people where we live. So we're not proposing one-to-ones as part of a campaign or a project. Relationships are what are needed now. So you might see ways of weaving this in with what you're already doing. Martin, do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, well, it's kind of a curious thing to say, well, we're going to, we're going to need to train people in, in how to talk to people. I mean, it, it sounds crazy in a way. Um, and yet um, our experience is that this is just not as easy as it sounds. Um, we're actually pretty good at um, having those one-to-one -one conversations uh, within our immediate circle. But in terms of meeting the stranger, in terms of moving outside of those circles, it, it's actually a pretty challenging thing to do. Um, because we're not trying to convey a message, we're trying to simply uh, listen and encounter um, somebody else's story and humanity. Um, now, one of the things we found in our local church is that um, many of our members, church members, are doing things in, in the COVID period that we've been asking them to do for years, which they've never done before, which is they're now joining local uh, groups um, on whatsapp and all these other social media uh, um, channels and and actually they're getting into some very significant conversations um, but actually structuring that in such a way that uh, we learn to listen to what the spirit might be saying in the midst of that um, is actually quite important and so even though it sounds um, counterintuitive uh, to say we need to train people to, in how to talk and listen actually there is some tremendous value in that so I'm, I'm grateful for the the guys in Battersea who are doing that but the other aspect of that is simply that um, uh, um, it sounds like a very weak thing to do oh we're just going to go and have conversations with people well that doesn't sound as if it's going to change the world but the surprising thing is that the, it does unleash amazing things and so, if you like, a, a little bit of a challenge um, to uh, all of us, uh, participants today, um, to um, all of us, um, even on the panel, would be to say, well, look, 
try it, <laughs> but come back um, when you've actually done it at least 10 times um, and tell us what, what you've experienced. So um, yeah, let's just, um, let's just have a go uh, because we can kind of promise, is that right, Morris? We can kind of promise <laughs> that actually the practice is incredibly powerful. Jenny. I, can bear, I can bear witness. That's, that's the key practice, is to re-embed yourself in the place that you are and find your vocation and meaning in the place that you live with the people that you live with. More than anything, that's what I think. So what, what we're saying is, is you might find ways of weaving this practice into what you're already doing. Um, and it's one step towards writing this new story that, that we've been talking about. And, and as the, the economic fallout of the pandemic continues to unfold, the need for this new story is becoming more and more acute. Um, our civic immune systems have been weakened and they need strengthening. And so we think the churches can and should offer some resistance from the bottom up. Um, so these friendships of trust and reciprocity with our neighbours, it's, it's not a soft option. It's a tough ask, but it's necessary for the restoration of our common life. Um, so we're just coming towards the end now. Um, and I just wanted to um, give an opportunity to uh, each one of us to give some final thoughts. Um, then maybe go to, to William. Would you like to, to share any final, final thoughts to start with? I'm unmuting myself there. So yeah, I'm just reading what Linda has said about how we need to set all this in within the context of our praying for the coming of God's kingdom. And that's surely cor <laughs> correct, says the vicar. We need to continue to pray. Um, and in fact, for me, lockdown had, was a time of, was a time of um, quite deep, silent prayer. Uh, and I think in that, I experienced something of the abundance that um, that is available in our community in our midst. We don't have to we don't have to go outside where we are to to, to experience that to know that. So I I'm interested in how uh, th this work can be set within uh, practice of contemplative prayer. So um, Al, just before you go, would you like to to say something? I know you've you've got to jump <coughs> off onto another. Shortly. Yeah, I apologize. Um, I, I am really uh, animated by so many of the comments and interactions uh, and want to take some time to really dig into that. Um, I think secondly, I'm, um, I, 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 I get a sense from this conversation that a lot of us are, are wanting to dig into this covenant conversation quite deeply. Um, what I think is still the, 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 the large question is, as, as gatherings, as, as, as communities of God's people where we are, how do we begin to really dig into this and recognize that this is a huge ask and calling? And I think we're still wrestling with that one at this point in time. But thank you, everybody. And I apologize for needing to leave. I'm going to wrap up shortly, but um, Fred, would you like to, to say a few words before we wrap up? Yeah, uh, yes. I think, I think one of the things that I would encourage us to think, think about are, are just two words. One is solidarity and the other is the ordinary. Um, solidarity meaning a letting myself be affected by the joys and suffering of others. Not putting people in a position to have to explain why they hurt and they grieve. Um, not, not, not expecting people to qualify or quantify their suffering with me, but just simply to, to let myself be affected by what I see going on in their own humanity. I think that's critical to covenant. Um, I think another thing right now in this time is about the ordinary. Um, and Martin, you mentioned it, one-to-one -one conversations may seem ordinary, but that's the point. Sending cards and writing, you know, finding the most analog approaches to be present with people in the ordinary, that's the point. I feel like there's a hunger right now, not for the sensational, but just for the ordinary. 
And so I would encourage us to not try to look for the sensational and the grandiose, but to look for the ordinary. Great. Thank you so much, Fred. Sarah Jane, do you want to say a few words? I actually just want to say some thank yous. I just wanted to thank Fred um, as a fellow representative of this half of this the other side of the Atlantic. I just really wanted to say thank you for sharing um, with us and thank you for sharing your story and for William as well. I really appreciated the grounded stories and the ability to imagine what was going on in your context and what that was looking like and the ordinariness and the messiness and the wonderfulness of it all. And I also wanted to say a big thank you to the part, to the uh, folks who've participated with us. And I know it's a bit awkward and strange sometimes when you see other faces and you're not, your face isn't there. And there's just been a lot of um, wonderful questions and reflections going on in the chat. And I know that um, we're really looking forward to spending some more time with those because I know we can't attend to them all like we would like in this kind of uh, an environment. So we are really looking forward to listening closely and attending to those questions and comments. Thanks, Sarah Jane. Morris, do you want to say a few words? You need to unmute yourself, Morris. I'm not usually muted, so thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, this has been wonderful. I also want to say, Fred, great to, great to meet you. Um, and and to, to follow the, what I've found is that the, the, that the sublime is in the mundane that we're, we're looking for bigger things, but if we find love where we are, that's the greatest blessing that can be. And that's really what, what this is about. Uh, it's gonna be a very long journey um, for all of us, but, it, but if, it's, if it's built on relational faithfulness, um, it will be real. And, and that's to be found exactly where we are. So not to get caught earlier with the negative dialectic of just, apathy and outrage and not to be overwhelmed by the forces of of negativity and then individual redemption it's going to be a relational story so fred thanks again the the sublime and the mundane are absolutely married and that's where the covenant is found great so uh, martin do you want to say a few words before we finish no so briefly um we said at the beginning that this was uh a, con uh, a consequence of a conversation that a number of us have been having across the Atlantic. And we then have opened that conversation up to so many of you. Uh, we know from experience that many of you will be watching, uh, many others will be watching this uh, post the event. We've seen that before. And so we're, our promise to you is that uh, we will continue to uh, extend this conversation to whoever would like to participate in it. But thank you for your participation today. We appreciate it.